Here's the song that we'd like to do for all the younger set of people, the teenagers and what have you. This one's called Vacation Zoe. From Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and somebody said something about an election tomorrow. But that's small news compared to what we have on tap today. Please help us welcome the man who taught you to be rich, special guest, Ramit Sethi. Plus, how's your family's fire escape plan? Today, we'll share tips on how to secure your biggest asset, your house, and your most precious assets, your family, with Steve Kerber from the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. And don't you worry, we'll still save time to toss out the Haven Lifeline to Ethan, who has a question about HRAs. What's an HRA? Well, you'll have to tune in to find out. And, of course, I'll share some of my thrilling trivia. And now, two guys who might finally learn how to be rich after all these years. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-G. We are wealthy in experiences. You know why? Because we get to kick off the week podcasting with you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Stacky Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salcihi, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and here to kick off not just another Monday, but also the day before Election Day and also by the hashtag Doug 2020. Got to say that contractually (laughs) obligated. Contractually obligated. Yes. And also the guy who is uh, here to bring it for another nine weeks this time, nine weeks, Mr. OG. It's a diner. Did I catch a niner in there? What that means is we are finishing off the entire year. Our next break is going to be over the holidays. So that'll be, that'll be fun. Nine straight weeks of goodness. It's like the, um, it's like the 12 days of Christmas, but in podcast form and nine and weeks and three times a week. So that's actually like 27 days. The 27 days of Christmas. 27 days of Christmas. You're welcome, America. You're welcome. You're welcome. Welcome, America. I'm going to say you're welcome for this, too. Coming up on November 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, we have a live YouTube event called The Stack. You'll have OG and I plus uh, the host of our network shows. Bobby Rebel will be with us from Money with Friends and Doc G from Earn and Invest podcast. But get this, Vicky Robin is our headliner. You can ask Vicky Robin questions Hang out with us and Vicky. If you haven't read Vicky's book, Your Money or Your Life, what are you waiting for? Plus, because of the fact that we only do a three ring circus here on the Stacky Benjamin show, Michael Santos, who was a cocaine dealer. In fact, it's funny, he could not deal enough cocaine. So he decided to move to Miami so he could get really into it. And that led to a long, long prison sentence, OG. Imagine. Hey, you got to fish where the fish are. <laughs> yes. And it led to a long prison sentence. And Michael has one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard. You can see it, by the way, on Million Stories, which is from our friends at the Singleton Foundation, a great foundation on financial literacy. Michael Santos going to join us. And Dan Chan, who's one of the top magicians in the country, normally does sleight of hand tricks. Once COVID hit, he had to pivot. And coming up on November 10th, He's not only going to talk about pivoting for success during this time when things need to be different, uh, he also might show us a few magic tricks. So how about that, huh? The stack. How do you get there? Stackybenjamins.com forward slash stack to reserve your spot. We're hoping, we're hoping to have 2,000 friends join us that day live. Should be a great time. All right. Speaking of great time, we got be Mr. There or be square. That's right. We got Mr. Ramit Sadie. Joining us again, so excited to talk to our good friend Ramit. But first, we got some headlines, so let's get started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. 
Our first headline comes to us from the Daily Mail. It's written by Amy Gordon for Mail Online. Cyclist, age 70, sues investment banker for 50,000 pounds. 50,000 pounds of what? Oh, this is British. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say pounds of what? <laughs> 50,000 pounds of bacon. After claiming he was left brain damaged. Oh, when her cocker spaniel ran into his path and caused him to crash. David Crane, age 70, was riding to work across a park on his morning commute. Karina Reed's Cocker Spaniel ran into his path while chasing a ball in London. Mr. Crane says he was left brain damaged after it caused him to break hard, sending him flying over handlebars. Claims crash affected his ability to work, says he can no longer drive or ski. He's demanding thousands in compensation and suing under UK Animals Act, 1971 Animals Act. Mr. Reed's lawyer says act only relates to damage done by a dangerous animal. Yeah, so, so the defense is... Uh, hey, killer that, cocker spaniel. Yeah, that act only applies. But here's the thing, OG. This brings up two things. Mr. Crane, the guy on the bicycle, probably a really safe bicyclist. How many times have you had somebody say, "Hey, I don't need disability insurance because I'm super safe on my bike. I don't need yeah. I don't need any disability coverage." It had nothing to do with him. This dog runs in front of him randomly, right? And I'm sure. I'm not sure I wasn't there, but I'm probably 95% sure that this woman didn't say, Hey, let's see if we can knock the biker down. So I'll throw the ball over in the way of the biker. It's just, it's you just, never know. <laughs> that's right. People, evil people everywhere. Assuming this was all just a big random mistake. Yeah. While disability insurance doesn't solve everything, man, it would be a relief for him. I'm sure. Or umbrella insurance for the, for her, for for the investment banker person, you know, who was out playing with her dog, you know, it's uh, completely, like you said, completely random events, but that's how weird risks happen. That's how weird outcomes happen. It's like mom says, it's not you, it's the other guy. It's not you, it's the other guy. I'm trying to teach my kids right now. Uh, my oldest is 13. He's going to start driving in three years, two years, I guess. I don't know what the rules are. <laughs> it's something we'll have to look up sometime soon. Every time he gets in the car with me, I say the same thing. Everyone out there is trying to kill you. It's just going to be the mantra that, you know, is going to be beating his head for the next three years because I want him to recognize that. And we, as soon as I said that, we, ha we were leaving school and it was a rainy day. We're sitting at the stoplight. We're first in line. The light turns green. It's three lanes in each direction, four, four ways, whatever. Light turns green. I start going and here comes this truck that is a block and a half away and hasn't even hit the brakes yet doing 50 miles an hour into a red light. Not even thinking about it. Not even. And, and we're, we're first up. So I literally stopped in the middle of the intersection and, and made eye contact with this guy. Just sat there until I made eye contact with him. And then he slammed on his brakes and slid his entire truck through the intersection because it was so wet and he was driving so fast. Right. He would have slammed into you. Oh, Absolutely. And I told my son, I said, see, everyone's trying to kill you. Like, it's just, this is just how it is. So you have to think about those weird events and go, how much is a million dollars of umbrella insurance? I saw somebody the other day, very defensively talking about why you don't need an emergency fund. And, uh, cause I've got credit cards. Yes. Well, and it's, Hey, I can leave my money invested and Hey, maybe it's going to be down a little bit, but big deal. Why wouldn't I leave all my money invested? And uh, optimizing everything, buying no insurance leads, leads nowhere. Leads. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the outcome could be fine. That's the thing. It, it's, it's not about buying insurance. It's about having a plan for if you need it. And maybe your plan for if you need it is, you know, I'm going to move to a lower cost of living area. In lieu of having higher amounts of insurance, I'm going to have a higher emergency fund to cover some unknown expenses. You know, the, the answer isn't always, well, I'm going to go buy some insurance. The answer is think about the risk and think about, okay, if this were to happen, now this is a weird one, the one we're talking about today, but this could be anything, right? I mean, half the country was covered in ice <laughs> last week in Amarillo. They got like a foot of snow. I mean, how many kids slipped on the concrete? That could be the same thing, right? You forgot to shovel and the mail carrier bumps his head, her head, you know, or the neighbor kid jumps the fence and jumps in your pool and gets hurt. What do you do in those situations? Sometimes you want to transfer that risk to a third party and sometimes you don't. 
and that's okay. There's no right answer to that, but you have to have thought about the solution in advance. Well, I like your strategy better anyway, because I feel like insurance agents, insurance companies want you to start with buying insurance. And instead, I like widening that to what you're talking about, which is how do I cover this risk, right? What's the risk? I'm bicycling. What are the things that could happen? And I'm sure a cocker spaniel randomly running in my way to catch a ball is not on that list. But what if something causes me to fall that wasn't my fault and I, yeah. and I hit my head? What do I do then? And then I think you end up with the right plan instead of just, just insurance. Yeah, good stuff. And in our second headline, if your home is your castle and your loved ones are precious, you want to pay attention because October was Fire Prevention Month. And Steve Kerber from the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute joins us. Is I can't believe October already left, Steve. Where did it go? Oh, every year it goes so fast. I'm glad that you're here with us, and uh, I would have loved to have run this in October, but because of COVID for me and moving around the country, but I think it's always a good time for us to kind of put the family through some drills and practice good fire safety. What are some great tips you guys have to help people be more safe? Yeah, fire safety doesn't know what month it is, and it's a challenge all year long, particularly as we get into these winter months when people start putting on their, their heating and spending more time inside and candles and holidays. So what we really want people to do is understand how little time they have to get out of their house if they do have a fire. We want people to have working smoke alarms on every level of their home, and uh, especially in the basement uh, where this show's coming from. We want to make sure that's protected and uh, have an escape plan. Practice it with your family. Know how you're going to get out. Know two ways out of, of every room in your home. Uh, know where you're going to meet outside. And finally, close before you doze. Uh, sleep with those bedroom doors closed. So if should you have a fire, you've got a lot more time to react. Figure out if you're going to get out, how you get out, and uh, buy you those precious moments. When you talk about how little time we have, Steve, how little time does the average family have? We're looking at three minutes or less. So not anywhere near as much time as you used to have in the past. Uh, now that everything in our homes is made out of synthetic materials, the fire spreads very quickly. So we need to uh, get notified very quickly with those smoke alarms and get out fast. And that's why the importance of the closed door, I would guess then, huh? How much does the closed door insulate you? Oh, it can make a difference between life and death. Uh, when you've got less than three minutes, picture yourself asleep, dead asleep, and you get woken up by the smoke alarm. Your egress path might be cut off from the get-go. Uh, so that'll keep the smoke away from you, keep the heat away from you, so you can figure out, can you make it to that front door? Can you make it to your normal exit? Or do I need to go ahead and find my way out a window? When you and I talked last year, I was frankly very surprised, and I felt like I was way out of the loop. I feel like I'm up on technology, but I had no idea how far smoke alarm technology had come. Walk us through that. What are some of the things smoke alarms do now that they didn't do 10 years ago? Yes. Yeah, so they're starting to have smoke alarms that are have longer life batteries. So not what you're used to or change your clock, change your battery, and you put the new 9 volt in. Uh, you can have a sealed alarm that lasts 10 years. So you don't have to worry about changing the battery. Uh, there's a number of alarms that are uh, have apps. They're addressable online. So you can check kind of the, the battery life online and they're interconnected. So if one goes off, they all go off. And really, they're putting new sensors in them now so that they can oftentimes tell the difference between what is a cooking nuisance alarm and what is an actual fire. So we don't have all those false alarms and have people pulling them down off the ceiling. Wow. And you guys did a study, and I may have gotten this wrong because of my cloudy head this last week, Steve, but in your study, do most people think that they can grab all the important things in their life before they get out of the house? And if and if that is correct, is is that is that an incorrect thought that I can grab everything before I get out of my house? It is incorrect. Um, you've got to be ready to go. We can't have people gathering up all their belongings, figuring out what's going on, the amount of time people think they have. I mean, our, our survey found that half of people believe they'd have enough time to gather what's important to them. I mean, there's 50% of the people that if caught off guard, particularly in the middle of the night, are going to find themselves in a very dangerous position. You guys also have a new video out. By the way, we'll put that on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Anything else, Steve, that people should probably know here? Well, it's just uh, as we get into these holiday times, uh, start thinking about fire safety. A lot of people don't think a fire is going to happen to them. 
but that's when you're in the most trouble is when you think you're fine. It's not something you have to think about. So uh, we want to be safe, have those heaters checked, uh, have those chimneys clean, check those smoke alarms, make sure they're working, uh, make sure that they're not more than 10 years old. If they're more than 10 years old. You got to get new ones. The sensors go bad. They've got a lifespan. And uh, just be safe with those Christmas lights, the Halloween costumes, keep them away from flames. There's just so much to know to keep your family fire safe. Big thanks to Steve for stopping by. I know when he was here last year, OG, you guys had fun as a family going through your your plan. And drawing out all the exit routes and stuff like that. Yeah, here's here's what we're going to do if yep. there's a fire in the house. Good idea to probably rehash that. I know Steve and I didn't talk about it this year, but last year we did, that the kids will practice this at school. It's often the parents that have no idea. So yep. practice it as a family, and I think the kids enjoy it, and uh, parents also Enjoy it. Make it part of Taco Tuesday. Taco and Fire Safety Tuesday, we'll call it. All right, guys, let's pretend you're burning alive. What would you do besides scream for help? I'd add some guac to my taco. No. <laughs> That's the only way to eat them, right? Keep the doors closed. Speaking of guacamole on tacos, aren't you glad you're back in Tex-Mex land? <laughs> it is. It is about to, although in fairness, you know, I get here and 24 hours later, I get diagnosed with COVID. So it doesn't, it, yeah, yeah. It hey, was COVID related. I told all my friends in town, I texted them. I'm like, yeah, great. Welcome guys. Hey, Thanks well, for that. welcome back. They're, they're like, Joe, you're not supposed to lick everything. I, who knew? I thought that built antibodies. You're like at the border, like kissing everyone who comes in. You're like, I'm home. <laughs> I'm home. <laughs> you're like, sir. Yes. Sir, step away. <laughs> Sir, this is an IHOP. Well, I was just pretending I was that guy in the Dodgers. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Just kissing the trophy after everybody else kisses. What the yeah, hell was yeah. that dude thinking? Who knows? Anyway, uh, big thanks to Steve Kerber for stopping by. Everybody practice your fire safety, Get guys. Your fire plan. Yes. My house burned down when I was in fourth grade. It sucks. Get a fire plan. Leave the doors closed before bed. Good stuff. I don't know how much introduction you need to this man, if you're a money geek at all, but if you're new to this uh, community and you're excited about finally gaining control of your money, there's one person who you really need to know, and that is Mr. Ramit Sadie. Ramit has done so many great things, but one of our favorites in our family, speaking of family, was a gift that I gave to my son during his high school years when he first became interested in money, was a book called, I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Ramit Sadie not only has that, he has a new company called Earnable, where he helps people create and work new business ideas. And if there is a guy, OG, as you know very well from following Ramit all these years, if there's a guy who knows how to speak plainly and bluntly about what to do and what not to do, it's probably Ramit. So here he is, Ramit Sadie on my dad's shortwave radio. And on my dad's shortwave radio, it's our good friend, Ramit Sadie. How are you, man? Doing very well. It's nice to talk to you again. Are you holding up well with this COVID thing, or is this a big time for you and your business? I am holding up well. I feel very fortunate. Uh, you know, my family is safe. I'm safe, and I've always worked from home. So in that regard, nothing much has changed. My team has worked from home, and I'm very thankful that they don't have to go through a lot of changes in their lifestyle. In terms of business, definitely people are more interested in money than they have been in a long time. They're interested in coming to us and learning how to start a business, you know, which we teach with Earnable. They're interested in how do I find a different job. A lot of them have realized they hate commutes, and they actually kind of like working from home. So they want to figure out how to lock this in so that they don't have to go back to the commute. And then, of course, there are people who are in more dire straits, you know, real financial challenges. And so we've been speaking to all of them and trying to work uh, day by day to help them get their money to the right level and get their business and careers to those levels as well. It seems like for a lot of people now, especially is a time when people feel isolated and it's a great time to have a network 
And I was wondering how important has your network been to you in the growth of all the things that you've done or meet over the years? Very important. Uh, you know, they say it's not what you know, it's who you know. There's this phrase, and people usually scorn when they say it, like, ugh, life is just about who you know. But a lot of that is true. And so the answer is not to dismiss it. It's actually to learn how to meet interesting people. And I would say in my business, you know, starting off from the early days, I, a lot of, I got a lot of good advice as to what makes sense, what doesn't. I remember sitting in a taqueria in San Francisco with a friend of mine, an entrepreneur, who told me that if she had 50,000 email subscribers like I did at the time, she said, I'd be making a million dollars a year. And that kind of blew me away because I was not thinking that big. She also told me that uh, I was discussing a career change at the time. And I was kind of uh, hesitant to make a change because I had invested a lot in a certain company and I wanted to be known for X, not Y. And she said, you know what, Rumi, in Silicon Valley, nobody cares what you did. They care what you're doing. And these are just little nuggets that somebody's saying to me while we're eating burritos, but I still remember them 15 years later. And so that was, you know, a very important part of my network. And over time, it's grown at both for hiring and also just personal stuff as well. How much of your network comes from your time at Stanford? Because we hear competing things about the value of a college education, you know, and obviously there's a lot of great minds at Stanford. And I don't know if your network sprung from there or if it's an ongoing um, garden that you're constantly weeding. Both, both. And I'm so glad we get to talk about this because it seems like the idea du jour right now is for people on social media to say that college is worthless. And it's actually worse than worthless. It's a complete cost sink and there's no value to a higher education. I completely disagree. First off, let's acknowledge that there are some big, big cost problems with the rising cost of higher education. But I will tell you that a college education, we know the data that people who go through a college education have much higher lifetime earnings. So if you're strictly looking at education as an investment, a financial return, people with college educations tend to do much better. Then let's also acknowledge that college is not just about making more money. If that were the case, you can go to a technical trade school and those are very good. But there's other things like meeting new people, exposing yourself to bigger ideas and grappling, interrogating these ideas. That's the kinds of things I learned at Stanford. And you can learn them in many great colleges out there. There are, of course, top tier colleges like Stanford, et cetera. There are also amazing state colleges and universities everywhere. And many of them are very inexpensive. One last thing I want to add is that um, most people believe that the sticker price is what you pay. That is a complete myth. It drives me insane. I have two parents who are immigrants from India. They were not versed in higher education when they came here in terms of American higher education. They still figured out that you can get many, many scholarships. And in fact, I paid my way through undergrad and grad school at Stanford with scholarships. So you have to remember that these colleges might have a sticker price of 15K, 50K, even 75K. It's a small amount of people who are actually paying that sticker price. Most people are getting financial aid, some type of scholarship or scholarships. In my case, I applied to about 65 of them. They could also be working part-time or summer jobs or internships. So higher education, in my opinion, is not something to simply be dismissed. There's no way to grapple with these kind of intellectual questions other than to be in a setting with other people who are there for a reason. And while there are cost problems, and there are certainly some middle tier colleges that need to go out of business, uh, and there's some governmental changes I think need to be made, we shouldn't just get on board with everybody on Twitter saying college is worthless. It's not. It can be a fantastic option for a lot of people. I asked that question because I feel like this is a time when we need to lean on other people. And it's interesting. One of my favorite books of all time is a book by Barbara Walters about speaking to practically anybody about practically anything. And it's funny as I was online, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago, and I'm typing that in. I noticed that my friend Ramit had a course that was that was that was on that same topic. And you talk about this same thing a lot about approaching people. 
and about not being afraid to approach people. And I feel like between COVID and the fact that we're in our own home and we have to reach out electronically, we're more afraid than ever to reach out to people. But how do you, how do you break through that, Ramit? Well, culturally, we are set up not to interact with different people around us. Think about it. We live typically in suburban environments where to go anywhere, you have to get in a car. That makes it very unlikely to experience the serendipity, for example, of a big city where you are, by definition, by default, going to run into people. Right. Okay, so depending on where you live, that already sets the context for how many people you're going to meet on a given day. Well, and, and that's like being on a campus like Stanford, like we talked about. You're you're probably going to run into some professor that's done something amazing uh, in the course of every day. Or, or a student. I remember being in a dorm room, you know, we're drinking, it's 2 a.m. and everyone's taking shots. And then you look over and there's a thick textbook, Principles of Neurophysiology. And then you find out this person is a world champion at violin. Now, that is that was a rarefied time, and that's great. But let's also remember, you don't have to go to a Stanford in order to experience it. Yeah. You can experience it even if you live in a suburban, ordinary environment. And that would be things like creating your own book club. That would be things like going to any organization, you know, when it's safe to, whether it be a, a, a book talk or a concert, or whatever the case may be. The, the tricky thing, and I, I want to go into a little bit of, new, I think there's some nuance here. I don't want to blame people individually solely for not making and building relationships. Because again, if you live in an environment where by default, you could go a week without meeting anybody, then human nature says it's going to be really hard for you to meet people. It's not simply your fault, although you do have to take responsibility. But one of the things I learned when I, I moved to New York from San Francisco, and instantly within one week, I started walking like five times more. Why? It wasn't just that I got motivated. No, it was the environment I put myself in forced me to level up, to walk more, just by default. Nothing changed inside, but everything changed outside. So if you're listening to this, I think what we are raised with in America is a lot of dichotomies, this rugged individualism. Oh, I should be doing this and I can be a millionaire if I try really hard, but also a lack of social and cultural context to enable those successes. And so what we see is we see these rare success stories that happen. You know, somebody went from rags to riches. We love that story in America. And it can happen statistically. It can happen with luck. It can happen with hard work. All those things should be acknowledged. But when you see the vast majority of people, if you take a look at what people feel in America, there's a lot of great books recently out about loneliness in America. What do you think? Americans just magically lost the skill of social interaction in the last 40 years? No, that's not how it happens. And we should be honest with ourselves. Yeah, it probably is your responsibility. If people listening take an honest look in the mirror, how long has it been since you reached out to a friend and invited them to do something or just got on a phone call, particularly men who need an excuse or a reason to get together? That's why men love bachelor parties. That's why men love you know, other, there's a few capstone lifestyle events that they love, but you rarely hear two or three men saying, you know what, let's just hang. It almost never happens. Beyond that, it's not simply that you're a bad person, okay? Yes, we can take responsibility, but we can also look at the cultural context. We live in places that do not encourage us to have social interaction. People are busy. They need two income lifestyles just to sustain being able to pay rent or a mortgage and on and on and on. So it's quite complex. But if you're wondering, okay, great, this sounds terrible, Ramit. I'm really depressed now. What do I do? <laughs> well, <laughs> first of Thanks, all, dude. mission accomplished. <laughs> if, if you feel horrible, that's great. Now let's talk about what to do. The next step is really thinking about both internal and external. Okay, on an individual level, what can I do? Boy, I've got five friends I haven't reached out to in ever or six months or a year. Let me just text him and say, hey, I was thinking about you. Let's get on the phone this weekend. How does Saturday at 10 work for you? That's one thing. Take some responsibility. The second thing is to look externally. What are the forces outside of myself that are causing me to not live the kind of way I like? And then you can decide, do I want to keep living there? Do I want to make a change? 
I think that's powerful stuff. And I think this is a time when a lot of people have to make a change. We saw in the last few weeks, a Disney let go of 28,000 people, the airlines cutting over 40,000 people. I mean, there are a ton of people out there, you, you know, that are going to still lose their job during COVID here. If I'm somebody who's lost my job or somebody thinks I might lose my job, how do I think about the world differently today? What should I be thinking about? How should I frame this? The best time to think about it is before it happens. So first, I'm going to speak to people who have not yet lost their job. And I'm going to speak to you first because you have the chance to prepare yourself for what might come. I think a time like this has humbled a lot of us. You know, nobody thought that they might be on on unemployment. You know, I know people who as recently as March were doing great in their careers. And by May, they were on unemployment. That is a massive change to a psyche. And a lot of times it was it had nothing to do with their performance. It was not their fault. The world changed around them overnight. And that was humbling. If you have not yet been laid off or you're not at immediate risk, my suggestion would be to start planning for it right away. What's the worst that can happen? You save a little bit more money and, uh, you know, oh, you, you, this is especially for the fire nerds out there. Oh, you uh, extended your runway and how long you need for fire by 2.3 months over the course of your lifetime. Ramit, so conservative. What a Luddite. You guys are living in a dream world if you keep operating by the same rules that you've always operated on and also not taking time to account for risk. Risk changes. For example, one of the things that I advised my readers to do was once unemployment started skyrocketing, I said, guys, I typically advise a six month emergency fund. I'm now advising a one year emergency fund. Mm. That actually means you minimize your contributions to investments. You can even minimize how much you're paying off on debt. There's a very specific reason for that. Yeah, you're going to lose out on some potential investment returns over the course of six, 12, 18 months that it takes you to accumulate your your savings goal. But I would rather you be overprepared than be underprepared. This is a time for overreaction, not for panic, but for overreaction. So step one is really playing defense. It's building up that emergency fund. If you have zero, start targeting a year. Yeah, it might take you a long time, but at least you know the math of how long it's going to take me. Okay. And then once you've got that emergency fund, once you've played defense, keep investing right? Follow your plan. Don't stop and get scared of everything. You've played defense. You check that box. Now you need to mentally switch over to maintenance. And if you keep following your plan, if you've still got money, there's a small group of people who read, I will teach you to be rich. They're like, Hey, I did that. I did that. I've already been prepared for years. What, what are my opportunities? Then you actually have earned the right to go on offense. And offense means you can look for opportunities in a time like this you can invest opportunistically, you can start a business, uh, you can create partnerships where they would not have picked up the phone a year ago, but now they're like, okay, well, I'll take your call. Is there some way we can work together? Boom. But in order to play offense, you need to first play defense. So that's how I would think about it if you have not yet faced layoff. Let's talk about starting a business now. It seems, you know, a lot of people listening, I can imagine somebody walking the dog right now going, Ramit, you're crazy starting a business right now. But it also seems like during these times of fire, these are when some of the great businesses of all time have always begun. Yeah, that happened in the 2008, 2009 recession. Some of the great businesses of our modern times were started then. First, I just want to be candid. Of course, it's harder to start a business right now for a number of reasons. You know, people are at home. They don't have the infrastructure that we used to have. If you have children, they might be at home 24 seven. They're not going to school. That makes it really difficult. And I want to acknowledge that um, when COVID started, I heard a lot of these productivity wizards coming out saying like, now's the time to be ultra productive. Da, da, da. I, I appreciate the encouragement and inspiration. But I also think, you know what, there are some parents out there who are just trying to get by day by day. You know, there are some people whose partner lost their job, and they're trying to figure out how they can pay for their rent. So everybody's operating from a very different place. And if now is not the time for you to become a productivity wizard, or to start a business, that's perfectly fine. 
But I also want to point out that there are a lot of people who have situations where they have time and they're looking around saying, hey, I have my savings. I have time. I don't have to commute two hours a day now. What, what can I do right now to really set myself up? So for those people, yeah, starting a business can be an incredible opportunity right now. The first thing that people often think is um, nobody's buying right now. And this was especially true when COVID first hit, but that's that's not true at all. There are always people buying. And if you just think about, like, for example, parents, what would they pay in order to keep their kids busy for 90 minutes? They pay anything. They're like, take all my money, please. Just keep this kid out of my hair for 90 minutes. Please, let me take a nap. <laughs> They'll pay anything. So, and then there's a variety of other things. You know, for thousands of years, people have paid to entertain themselves, to adorn themselves, just purely because they want it. And in the you saw in the first few months of COVID, people were very nervous about promoting anything, et cetera. Now people have kind of gotten a little bit more used to it. I have a lot of students who have joined my Earnable program. Many during COVID, they started businesses, and now many of them have multiple clients. Some of them have made over $10,000 and on and on. And they're taking these ideas and adapting them for the times. I'll give you an example. Remember those classes that people used to go to? It was wine and painting. You would go on a Friday night. One of my students did that, but with Zoom. And so you would paint remotely and you could see everybody else's painting. And I think initially she charged a hundred bucks per person. Amazing. That's incredible. I myself took a margarita making class remotely. Awesome. Happy to pay for some entertainment and get a drink. That's nice. That's one of many different businesses people have started. The biggest challenge is how do I even know what I'm good at and what somebody will pay for? All that stuff, which we teach in our earnable program. But I think that key things to remember are if you feel comfortable enough to start a business, if you're looking to add additional income, and if you want to give yourself options so that maybe when commutes start again, you don't have to participate in that, now might be an incredible time to diversify your income sources and start a business. I think about a lot of people, Ramit, listening, thinking that they don't have skills that uh, they could start a business with. And yet in both of those examples, the first person may have been either a painter or an art instructor somehow, and they just took it online. The second person might've been a bartender, right? Thinking, okay, I'm a bartender. I can't tend bar now. The bars are closed across America, largely. I can't do that. And yet you talked about making a margarita class. Like I think, it, I think what you're explaining here is you just need to think a little differently about your skill set. It's not that you don't have the skills. You might just need to uh, change around your way of thinking about your skills. Yeah, here's what I want everyone listening to do. So pull out your phone. Oh, you might be listening on your phone. I don't know how to do this. Just do this now or in five minutes. I don't know. Okay, you pull out your phone and I want you to text five friends individually and say, hey, I'm listening to this podcast and this guy asked us to do an exercise. So bear with me. What would you say that I'm good at? AKA, what are the things that you would come to me for advice on. This is amazing. Okay. So when you do this exercise, please let me know on Twitter or Instagram. I'm at Ramit. I want to hear and tag this podcast. I want to know what you hear from your friends. First of all, most people are so self-absorbed that they've never thought about how they are perceived to their friends. That's number one. They've never thought about what the market thinks of them. Number two, a lot of people don't have the confidence to realize they're actually really good at things. So for example, here's some of the common answers that people get back. Oh, you're really good at style. You always have a great outfit together. Oh, you always keep your apartment super organized, like on and on and on, all these things. And to the person who dresses well, they're like, what? Like, that's just normal. That's what I do every day. No big deal. But you could turn that business, that idea into a six-figure business. Personal organizer. You can charge $150 per hour or thousands of dollars for a single engagement. Those are just two ideas. So everyone has something you're already good at. You just don't know it. That's why you ask your friends. And then you can use tools like Earnable or other places to figure out how to actually turn that into a profitable business. But what I want everybody to know is you're sitting on at least one idea right now. That could be highly profitable to you. You could do it from probably the comfort of your own home. 
and it can actually be fun. That's what creating a business can do for you right now. Let's talk about Earnable here for just a moment because we talked about networking, I think, and, and about mentorship a little bit at the top here. When I was early in my career, I had great mentors that taught me that pack hunting like wolves was always the best way to hunt because there are other people going through the same thing that you're going through. I feel, Ramit, that that's a lot of what Earnable's about. Yes. As social animals, we need to be around other people who are experiencing it. And if you're listening to this, odds are you probably subscribe to a couple of other podcasts some newsletters. Not nearly and as good as this one, though. No, 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 no. I mean, get off those. Just unsubscribe from all those podcasts right away. I mean, what are you doing wasting your life listening to those substandard <laughs> competitors? Here's the thing. You can subscribe to everything you want, and yet it can feel very lonely because every day you're getting some, some inspiration or some tactic in your inbox, and yet you simply look at yourself and you say, well, why am I not making this work? Why am I not connecting the dots? And that starts to feel really bad. People start to beat themselves up and say, maybe I'm just not good at this business thing. I did a survey of my audience. How long have you been thinking about starting a business? Approximately 50% of them said for over three years. Yeah, I believe it. Three years? That's way too long to be sitting around thinking of something instead of actually doing it. I would rather you said, you know what? I thought about this for two months. I'm going to take a swing at this. Oh, I failed on my first time. No big deal because I have a process. Now I know exactly what to do my second time. That's faster. Ooh, failed the second time. Third time, nailed it. You're better off than the person who's been subscribed to 20 other things and dreaming. Dreamers, anybody can be a dreamer. That's cheap. That's easy. How about being a doer? And so with Earnable, what we did was... We first started by incorporating all the insights we've learned from starting our own business, also helping thousands of other people start businesses in over 50 industries. Okay, so we have access to those students and their data. We brought it into Earnable. So we brought these, what we call them verified six-figure earners. We went through their earnings, we verified them, and then we reverse engineered their business. How did you do that? What was your first idea? How did you go from that first idea, which frankly was horrible, to this six-figure business? Walk us through every step, all the prices you charged. Case studies. Then detailed case studies. And then we started to go even more in depth. We brought students into New York, into a studio, and I walked them through their businesses. I showed them how to improve their offers, how to find an idea. I showed them right on the spot how to write better copy. All of this is included, and it's not just lessons, right? Of course, the lessons are there, and we show you the actual copy to use, but it's also watching people go through it because you can see yourself in it. People are resistant to changing their first idea. Somebody never thought of this, and we show them how to think creatively. And then finally, we went into a level of specificity that we never saw anywhere else. You know, a lot of these business programs, they tell you, have a sales call, write a funnel, et cetera. I said, you know what? I'm just going to do actual sales calls and record them. And you can listen to every word I say. And sometimes I bomb and sometimes I close the deal right there on the spot. So all of these things combined with live help that you get and a community of other students who are very successful suddenly changes it from being alone at your computer reading some random newsletter to actually being a part of something and knowing that you can start a business and increase your earnings. We'll link to Earnable on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Uh, Ramit, I wish you had fun with this. I really don't get a sense that you're enjoying <laughs> yourself or that you're you're into this emotionally. I wish you got a little emotional about it. I know, I know. I'm so, I'm, this is, I have to tell you, this is my dream job because first of all, my, my dream is to get really good at something and then to bring everybody else with me. Okay, so that's number one. Two, I get the chance to confront liars openly. So people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, I really want to start a business. I'm like, oh, really? How long have you been saying that? They're like six years. I'm like, how many newsletters do you subscribe to? Uh, 16. And I'm like, how do you reconcile the fact that you say you want to do it, but you haven't actually done anything about it? And then they just go like, they stare at me blinking. And I'm like, this is the greatest joy of my entire life. Now, I don't want to do it vindictively, maybe 5% vindictively. But I really think that Candidly, most people don't have somebody in their life who's honest with them. Honest when they're doing a fantastic job. Honest when they acknowledge, hey, you know what? It might not be realistic for you to start a business right now if you have three kids at home. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, 
I'll do that later, not right now, it's not for me. And also honest, this is the rarest of all, honest when somebody says to you, you know what? I think you could have done better on that one. I don't think you gave it your all. You know, I asked my readers, when was the last time somebody said something like that to you? And many of them said, first grade. Nobody talks candidly to other people. And whether it's about personal finance, where I tell people, forget about your $3 lattes, buy as many as you want. That's not going to change your life. Get these five to 10 big wins right, and that will change everything. Very few people are talking about that. Another thing in careers, it's not simply about wishing you're going to get paid more. There's a way to negotiate your salary for 10, 15, or $20,000 raises. You don't just walk into your boss's office and kick it down and say, hey, give me some money. They're going to throw you out. But there's a structured process, including even the words to say and the timelines to use. And that candor, that truth that, hey, it's going to take a lot of work. It is, but it's worth it, as opposed to sailing on the river of life and letting the river take you wherever it's going to take you. That's not the way of I will teach you to be rich. Hey, trivia fans, I'm your pal and presidential favorite, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And remember to use hashtag Doug2020 in all your tweets these next couple days. Well, tomorrow is the big day, and as you know, my whole life has been preparation for this culminating moment. All of those hours of doing very little, turns out I was just saving moments for those about to happen in the next four years. And we both know that this election is in the bag. You can see why they didn't invite me to debate Trump and Biden. No sense debating those chumps. Which reminds me, I've got some election-themed trivia for you. And it's actually a two-parter. First, how many total electoral votes are there? And maybe slightly easier, how many electoral votes do I need to win tomorrow to clinch the White House? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can say the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, even though OG and I are here in mom's basement, one thing you might not know is it takes an entire team to produce Stacking Benjamins from our engineer, Steve Stewart, who's in St. Louis, to Karen Rapine, who helps us with our guests like Rami. She is in Helena, Montana. Our friend Taylor Stevens, who does writing for the show, Taylor is in Phoenix, Arizona. Gertrude is down the street. Hopefully Doug doesn't find us anytime soon, but he's already bought the house next door again. So it takes a whole team and with different people in different places and all these different roles, it is, as you can imagine, a lot of fun to bounce stuff off each other, but that takes some good communication and good communication systems. For you, it's probably the same when it comes to work and managing your financial assets Having organization, goal setting, planning, and staying on track is super important. And that's where Monday.com comes in for us. And also it could be for you. We use Monday.com because it's super easy to use. It's flexible. It's incredibly visual. And it's funny, OG, when we decided to integrate our systems and go back to Monday.com, you immediately chimed in and, and said it is incredibly visual. Yeah, we use it for all of our process organization on our uh, planning business. So been using it a long time. Monday.com's designed to manage any team organization or process online. So for us, we use it for our workflow, the next five weeks of podcast organizing when the guest is going to come on and be recorded, when the different things are going to be written, when Doug's going to record his stuff. It's all together. It connects us by the way, with all the tools that we use, we use Slack, we use Google calendar, we use Gmail, we use Dropbox. We have Zoom calls. It's all integrated into Monday.com. We had all these as separate systems, and now they're all integrated into one single system so that stuff doesn't get lost, like emails getting lost or video calls getting lost or some vague action items. It's all there. No more back and forth for simple projects. Monday.com is totally customizable. You can drag and drop exactly what you need to build your own workflow so if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit monday.com for your free two-week trial. That's it. Head to monday 
stackingbenjamin.com for your free two week trial. And you'll see why we use it to make the stacking Benjamin show and why I think it would work great for your team as well. Hello, future constituents. It's your soon to be president, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And if you haven't already, you can go to vote.org to find your closest voting location and vote for your boy. That's right. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Hashtag Doug 2020. Totally not crooked. And on the off chance that you might vote for someone else. Well, maybe you just don't need to vote that bad, do you? But of course, you're voting for me. Otherwise, I mean, what kind of stacker would you be? Now that that's settled, let's get back to today's trivia. The question was, first, how many total electoral votes are there? And maybe slightly easier, how many electoral votes do I need to get tomorrow to clinch the White House? There are a total of 538 electoral votes, and I need at least 270 of those to help me become your fearless leader. (laughs) I look forward to my official address tomorrow probably around 9 p.m. Eastern time. See ya! I always learn so much when Ramit comes on the show. Big thanks to him for hanging out with us again, OG. I love what he said about networking and the value of of a college education. While I think some people don't know why they're in college, this idea that rubbing shoulders maybe with people who are who are doing some great work and learning from some pretty smart people can go a long way. And plus, I also like the online aspect that he talked about, about the fact that you now have the ability to network with whoever you want. I get to network right. with you. I, I can, I can tweet to you and you will sometimes answer me, which I find incredibly refreshing. <laughs> sometimes I answer my, my Twitter messages. <laughs> Networking is the only reason to go to college, right? I guess you learn some stuff along the way but you're really learning how to learn throughout that time. You know what I mean? You're learning how to take new information in and adapt it to whatever you're working on. And I understand you got to have a little piece of paper that says that you successfully checked off some boxes along the way for a lot of careers. But, but really it's about those, it is about those connections and it's about how to make those connections. And now with everybody just instantaneously transported to the future of we all work remotely and you know, George <laughs> Jetson. I mean, it really took that, right? Yeah. I was talking to a coaching friend of mine and his mom had lived through the 1819 flu pandemic in the 1900s, the Spanish flu. 1918, not 1819. 18 and 19. Oh, 18 and 19. Yes. Okay, 19, gotcha. 18 and 19, 19. Sorry. Yes. I was just, you know, there's too many, too many years. numbers attached. And so he was telling the story that he was with his mom and he was talking about this years ago. They were on vacation and he said, you know, what was the big thing you noticed? And they were quarantined in their homes for three months during it in Ohio, he said. And she said the biggest thing that happened was as soon as that got over, everybody had a telephone because we want that connection. Before that, you didn't need one, right? You just go into town or you go to your neighbor's house or whatever. Now all of a sudden you don't have that. And now you need to connect and that's telephone. And now, now, now everybody knows how to use zoom. Now everybody knows how to use it. No, it is. It's true. Right. Yes. And it's totally acceptable as a communication tool, as a business tool, as a family get together tool, as a social hour drinking tool. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, a, it's all of those things. We want that connection. So what he's talking about in terms of you know, connecting with people, you know, that's really it. Big stuff. Big thanks to Ramit again for hanging out with us. Hey, OG, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. I need to sample some pumpkin pie prior to Thanksgiving. I was so happy that you brought over some apple cider from the northern climates. Yeah, which is odd that you didn't bring over any over to me, considering you were there also at the same time. Uh, I was too busy with cat rescue and just ugly. I, I not, really wanted not, to do not, it. Not a second to spare. Couldn't wander into a grocery store for 20 seconds. To I should up. have gone over to the Franklin Cider Mills. What I, I didn't even think about a grocery store, frankly. I, I just thought about Franklin Cider Mills out of the way. I got a 15-hour drive in front of me with a cat. It's out of the way on a 15-hour drive. It's like six minutes that way. It is totally six minutes that way. I'm like, nope, uh, we, are, we are hitting the road. So shame on me. I'll be there at Thanksgiving again, but that's going to be too late. Yeah. Yeah. Everything will be dead and frozen. That'll stink. 
It is, by the way, the two things they say are most important at Haven Life Insurance Agency, your loved ones and your time. And that's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now and you'll get a free quote. You'll see the application has been pared down to only the questions you need to answer. You get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, and they're not a startup. Well, they are a startup, but they're backed by their parent company, which is not a startup, Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. So you know that the insurance is going to be there. Let's throw out the lifeline today to our new friend, Ethan. Say hi, Ethan. Good morning, Joe and OG. I'm calling about a HRA. I'm about to switch employers and my new employer offers a high deductible plan with an HRA but no HSA. Uh, I currently have an HSA and I'd like to keep contributing outside of my workplace. I know I won't get the payroll tax deduction, but given the tax advantages of an HSA, I'd like to continue to contribute on my own. With that said, I'm not sure if I can take the high deductible plan with the HRA and still contribute to an HSA. The HRA plan is the only one that has a deductible high enough to qualify to allow me to contribute to an HSA. So I don't know if I can have both one or neither. Anyway, thanks. Bye. Great question, Ethan. Uh, HRA, by the way, for everybody playing the home game here is a health reimbursement arrangement that is an employer funded plan. And it reimburses people like Ethan for qualified medical expenses. And in some cases, it might even cover your insurance premium. But, uh, OG, what do you think about this, uh, the HRA? What should you do? I think it's important to notice the big differences about this. And the major one is that an HRA is employer owned. So if you leave your job, you lose the money that's set aside for you. You can't transfer it like you can with an HSA. Yeah. It's not an account. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just, they decide, okay, we're going to reimburse this amount of dollars for this amount of things or this type of things. And once you use that, you use it. So it's just a, just a little bit of a benefit, but you can use them together and, you know, use the HRA money first and then go to your HSA. Uh, HRAs for small companies, the rules change at the beginning of this year, Ethan, where employers could offer employees a new type of HRA, which is called an individual coverage HRA in lieu of group health insurance. Now the good news is, is that you can use your HR money to then buy coverage if you want. The bad news is, though, that you're buying it as an individual and it's far more expensive. But what it does do, OG, I mean, in defense of that rule, it allows some of these small companies to offer some protection for people where in the past they weren't able to. So now more people can potentially be covered because of HRA. That said, once you get to the top of that number, you know, whatever the HRA reimbursement number is, OG, you got to have other resources. It's not like a high deductible health plan where it won't pay until you get to a number and then it pays everything above that number. This HRA has a hard stop at whatever their reimbursement is. Right. So the answer is uh, then, then yes, continue to use HSA, obviously then, right, OG? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Big thanks for that question, Ethan. And I think I will bet that you're going to work for a very small firm, which has positives and negatives. And one negative is they often struggle to provide benefits, which is where an HRA helps them out. Uh, hey, if you've got a question like Ethan had, feel free. Give us a call. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. Call us from whatever device, you know, your phone obviously has a microphone on it, your iPad, your computer stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. We're happy to help out. Number one, make sure that you're able to be a part of the financial revolution. And at the same time, we're also going to throw Ethan, one of our Stacking Benjamins Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirts. That's going to do it for today. By the way, I'm full well expecting OG to lean across the table and go, nope, we're done. But it hasn't happened yet. So if you're ready to hire a financial advisor in your corner to have a better 2021 than you had in 2020, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG to get on their calendar and talk about his team interfacing with yours to get where you want to go uh, next year and beyond. 
All right. That's going to do it for today. You've got it from here, Doug. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from Steve Kerber at UL. Practice fire safety. What's your plan? And keep those doors shut when you go to sleep. That one closed door may give you the seconds you need in a fire emergency. Second, take a lesson from Ramit. Networking? It's easier than ever to join a community. So think about who you know and join up. Yeah, who you know is a big part of winning. But the big takeaway? Seriously, people, even if you don't vote for yours truly, but we both know you're gonna, at least vote for someone. Tomorrow is your day to shine. Let's do this, people. Special thanks to Ramit Sethi for joining us today. You can find out more about Ramit's earnable program at IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com. And you know what? I'll also place a link for you on our show notes page at StackingBenjamins.com. You're welcome. Hashtag Doug 2020. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and if you could only know what it really smells like down here. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Also, don't forget to sign up for The Stack. It's our live event on YouTube. You can sign up and learn more at stackingbenjamins forward slash stack. Our special guests, Vicky Robin, Michael Santos, and the magician Dan Chan will be speaking and performing live with Joe and OG on YouTube on November 10th at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Be there or be square. Peace out, folks. I need to say a very special thank you to everybody who reached out with kind wishes when I revealed my diagnosis that I, that I had COVID. I have no idea how I got it. We went uh, hiking in the Grand Canyon and at another national park called White Sands National Park that I highly recommend. We went nowhere that I can think of that, who knows, OG, I was only around Cheryl the 10 days beforehand. And I'm thinking that random bathroom or grocery store, we sanitized our hands everywhere we went. I was positive. Did you sanitize other people's hands? That's the problem. That's probably the problem. So I have, I, I have no idea. No, no parties. Didn't uh, win a world series and, and go out and party with my team afterwards. Didn't do any of that. So I have no idea. I got very, very lucky, which, which is I didn't have any of the normal symptoms that we see a lot of people have, you know, friends that have had this in the past have talked about, it felt like an elephant sitting on their chest and it was harder to breathe or this horrible cough where you just can't clear your lungs. Didn't have any of that. My temperature spiked to 102 twice. We only had to use Tylenol to get it down. After two days, I no longer had a fever at all. I still, I had a headache and I felt achy. But the biggest thing of all for me was there was about a six day time frame. You kept checking in on me, texting me, and I was sending you these like one sentence 
text back where I just couldn't stay awake. I could not for the life of me stay awake. I would be fine for half an hour and then I would all of a sudden feel woozy to the point that I would sleep. I mean, I felt like I could just sleep on the floor. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to go back to the bed. I will just sleep right here. It just, bam, it just hit you like a ton of bricks. So that was incredibly frustrating that for six days, I did not want to wake up at all. I was sleeping monster hours, but the COVID that Paula had as an example and the COVID that I had were two totally different things. I guess you're lucky. Yeah. Big thanks to everybody who, uh, who reached out. I'm doing fine. But be careful out there, peeps. 